This is Thursday, August 4th, 2016. We are at the Bedford VA Medical Center in Bedford, Massachusetts. And this tape is part of the ongoing Veterans Oral History Project based at the Morse Institute Library in Natick, Massachusetts. My name is Maureen Sullivan, and today we have the privilege of interviewing Mr. Michael T. Green. Welcome, Michael. Thank you very much. May I ask when you were born? I was born January 25th, 1945. And where were you born? Winchester Hospital, Winchester, Massachusetts. Your marital status? I am married. Do you have children? I have two children. Grandchildren? I have four grandchildren. No great-grandchildren yet? No, not yet. Tell us a little bit about Winchester growing up. Um, since I didn't live in Winchester, mm -hmm. I actually grew up in Reading, Massachusetts. All right, so tell us what Reading was like. Reading was, was a great town to grow up in. I lived uh, in Reading um, on the one side of Reading, which was near Wakefield and Wake, Lake Quantapowit. So uh, the next street over was Line Road, and on that side, one side was Reading and one side was Wakefield. And uh, it, uh, and then you would hit 128. So when 128 was being built, I rode my bike up there when no cars were there. So, uh, but uh, it was a great neighborhood. Uh, everybody got along. I could, when my, mother, my mom worked and my dad worked different shifts, I could go have lunch at, at, any, at any number of houses uh, that my parents knew. Well, and, so you uh, actually saw 128 being built. I did. Wow. And uh, what did your father do for a living? My father worked for General Electric. He was a... Uh, a welder, he welded the casings on the jet engines. My mom worked for Sylvania and she was a supervisor. Um, I think at that time it was in Wuben and uh, she would ride with a, uh, what do you call it, when they had a number of people in the car. Uh, Trolley? No, oh. no. But a, a man used to take a bunch of girls to Sylvania, mm -hmm. carpool like. Okay. And how about uh, brothers or sisters? I have two older brothers and an older sister. My two older brothers were 11 years older and 10 years older than myself. My sister was almost five years older than myself. And my two brothers were born 13 months apart. They were all born in Boston. And then my Parents moved to Reading, and that's where I was born. And did your father serve in the war, or your mother? My mom and dad did not serve in the war, and I don't know why, actually. And where did you go to school? I went to the Reading public school system. Um, but back then, you used to get I used to get a bus ride, which was a, which was fun in those days. Mm -hmm. Um, because Reading doesn't have school buses anymore. And um, I went to the elementary school, then I went to the uh, junior, Parker Junior High School, and then I went to Reading, Reading High School. Now, Michael, you were going to school during a kind of interesting time in American history. It was post-war, and then we go into the Cold War. Do you remember things like uh, fallout shelters, <laughs> drills? Absolutely, absolutely. I, I, I can remember practicing. They'd, they'd ring a bell and we'd hide under our desks. And, uh, you know, of course it was the talk of the day. And I can remember in junior high, we had a science teacher who actually brought in a television set and we saw Sputnik go up, you know, uh, right in the classroom. So it was... Uh, he, he eventually, uh, in his career, became the principal of the high school. So he was, a, he was quite a guy. 
And do you remember what you were doing when President Kennedy was assassinated? Yes, I was, uh, that day I was, I was going to school in Boston. I would take the train and the trolley. And uh, I can remember coming home, getting off the train that afternoon. And that's when I heard it. And then of course from there, um, it, it was the, the news, the television, everybody just sat still not believing that John Kennedy had been shot and killed. You mentioned going to school in Boston. Where were you going to school? I was, I was going to Wentworth Institute. And why there and not Reading High School? Pardon me? Uh, why were you going to Wentworth and not to Reading High School? Oh, that was after high school. Oh, okay. That was uh, engineering college. Um, right by Huntington Ave, uh, right up the street from Northeastern. And uh, um, so that's, that's where I was. And when and where did you enter the military? I went, I went to enlist in the Marine Corps in 1966. I knew about Vietnam, that it was going on, and uh, I wanted to serve. And the reason, there were two reasons. One, I can remember doing map, map work in junior high of all the different countries, and there was the red on the map, which meant communism. So, although I didn't really know what communism was, I knew that it wasn't good. So, I wanted to go fight communism. And the other was uh, because my older brother in the Marine Corps, he had joined to go to Korea. But when he was in training, they signed the armistice, so he ended up spending time in Japan. and. Uh, he didn't have to go to war, which I'm glad he didn't. Um, so when I went into the, for the physical in the Army base, I had broken my collarbone earlier. Uh, I fell off a motorcycle, and it didn't heal right. And they rejected me, which I couldn't believe because I played hockey all through high school. I played best, you know, the park, tennis, golf. But they rejected me, and I, I, I couldn't really believe it. So I went to work, and uh, three years later when I was living uh, on Beacon Street, I got up one morning and said, I'm getting in that Marine Corps today. And I went down, and the second time, that was three years later, I got in. And the doctor at the end of the day said, he had kids yelling at him because they were being inducted, drafted. He said to me, Mr. Green, can you uh, handle Marine Corps boot camp? And uh, I said, I can do that standing on my head. And then I went, but I really don't want to do it standing on my head. And he smiled and laughed. And he stood up and he says, well, I'm going to give you, I'm going to give you what you want. And uh, he shook my hand and I said, thank you, Doc. It just made my day, and I was one of the only ones smiling going out of the Army base that day. All right, you're going into the Marine Corps with a smile on your face. Yes. But then you go down to Camp Lejeune? Paris Island. Paris Island for yep. your basic. For my basic. And tell us what that was like. Well, first of all, we went by train, and we went out of South Station. We actually stayed over for uh, the night. The train really slow. They stopped at every stop along the way. And uh, we stayed over one night and then got on the train the next night. And, uh, and you didn't really sleep or anything. So then we finished up. We got into uh, the next, we got into uh, South Carolina. And we were supposed to, at the train station, call a number. 
So now it was about 7 o'clock at night or whatever it was. And we called the number and they said, okay, we'll be down to get you. Well, we waited and we waited and we waited. And they, they didn't show up till probably midnight. And it went, wow, about time. So they took us to the front gate of Paris Island. They dropped us off. And the, the, the young Marines at the front gate were having us catch mosquitoes and they, don't kill them. We want to talk to them and find out their names. And we're going, oh. And what's your general orders? I said, nobody knew what a general order was, you know. And then another bus picked us up with more Marines on it. And that's when we finally went in. And the reason they did it in the dark was so you wouldn't know where you were. You'd have no clue as to what was around you inside. So we got up to the, the receiving barracks, and I'll never forget this. We pull up and a, a drill sergeant gets on the bus and he says, good morning, boys. How you doing today? So good to see you here at Paris Island. I want you to pick up your gear and uh, step out on the footprints outside. And then all of a sudden he says, I mean now, and he's screaming and everybody's kicking him off the bus. Well, we couldn't get off of that bus. If you were in the back, you were really in trouble. And uh, we stood on the footsteps, and that's when it all started. And they, what they did, they prepared you um, for when when our three drill instructors would come and get us. Um, it was either the next day or the day after. You know, get all your gear. Plus, they were probably sorting orders and stuff that came came in, you know, once they check off the names. And uh, they had one, one Marine was in my unit. He was, God, I don't, I don't think he was five feet. He was under five feet. <laughs> and the, they said to him, how tall are you? And he says, he's looking up, he says, six two. <laughs> oh, gee, he must have been, somebody set him up for that, you know? Oh, he says, six two, huh? So anyway, then finally the drill instructors come and get us, and, and outside of receiving there was a hill. And boy, oh boy, those sea bags by then were heavy with gear. And we had to run them up the hill, and they, all, all, a lot of the uh, people that were stationed at Paris Island were out there clapping, yay, yay, you recruits, go ahead, go get them, you know. And, so off we went, and that was the start of boot camp. And that's when you say, "Is why did I do this? <laughs> I take it you didn't have a smile on your face anymore. <laughs> I didn't smile that day, no. <laughs> well, you are in boot camp now. What was the rest of it like? <laughs> I, I found boot camp to be more psychological than physical. Um, maybe because I was a couple years older than most of the guys. Um, I yes, there were some um, there were some physical times, but it wasn't that um, horrendous. Um, I mean, if they come in and they they didn't like something that was going on. Uh, they'd have us do uh, calisthenics uh, with our feet up on top of the top bunk and our hands down on the floor and, you know, jumping jacks and leg lifts and for hours. And the whole floor would be soaking wet when you got done and you'd finally stand in that attention. And uh, he'd say, I hope he doesn't do this again for a while. So... Um, but I found it uh, more psychological than uh, physical, although they both played on each other. You had the our senior drill instructor was uh, a staff sergeant, and he he was uh, part Indian, part uh, Afro-American, 
and we had the next one was a staff sergeant, and the last one was a, a regular sergeant. And we couldn't understand, uh, he come from the South. So from a lot of us that came from, say, Virginia up, you know, you couldn't, half the time you couldn't understand them, you know. So, but we got through it, and uh, we actually, our, all the units win something. Our unit won the rifle range. We were the top shooters, uh, and there's, there was uh, four, uh, four platoons per, per group. I didn't say that exactly right. Four <laughs> platoons that go through at the same time. And uh, for that, our, our gift was, um, our, was to work the women's mess for a week. He we said, oh, when we started doing that, we were up at three o'clock in the morning. We didn't get hardly any sleep. And I thought after I said, if this is the best, what did the bottom shooters get? I, you know, but uh, we got through that too. I hate to imagine. And we're mentioning that your platoon won the rifle range. Uh, tell us a little bit about the weapons that the Marines trained you with. Um, in our, um, when we went through boot camp, it was, we trained with the M14. Um, as opposed to what we would carry in Vietnam, which was the M16. The M14 was a heavier weapon to hold over your head um, when you'd be out on the parade deck and uh, shoot with. It had a, uh, a larger bullet. Um, and for the most part, at that time, that's that's what we trained with. We had no pistol training when I went through. We had no uh, grenade training, but we would get that. But we would get that in Vietnam, out in the bush. So how long were you in basic? I was in basic probably uh, 10 weeks. And we're still in 1966? 1969. Oh, 1969, okay. 69. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And what happened after basic? After basic, uh, we graduated. My parents came down. And uh, the next morning, we would be leaving for Camp Lejeune. But before that, um, I'm sorry, this happened near the end of uh, basic training, where the senior drill instructor told us uh, our orders, whether you were going to school or you were going here or there. And so I, I knew that I wanted to go to Vietnam, so I was waiting for him to say Westpac. Westpac meant you were going to go to Vietnam. and. Uh, I got that word Westpac, so I knew I was going to Camp Lejeune to do additional training uh, with weapons and going out into the field and do, doing, uh, uh, what would you call them, games. Uh, um, sometimes I lose. Uh, That's okay. Yeah. So you're in Camp Lejeune, and how long were you doing the additional training? I think uh, Camp Lejeune was probably about the same amount of time, roughly. Right. And what kind of additional training did you receive? It, it, would, it would be, uh, they would push us to the limit. We would force march us, we would... Uh, we would shoot, we would practice shooting, we would uh, um, learn, learn about um, how you would, uh, when you got into a unit, how the unit would be formed as 
as you would go into um, Vietnam and how you would uh, uh, battle it, so to speak. Um, Were you given any instruction as to customs in Vietnam, what to expect? That is something that we didn't get. Could have been more of. Um, I think, um, you know, after I came home from Vietnam, but I know this comes later, mm -hmm. then I, then reading the books and so forth, I saw what I wished I had known going in just psychologically and, um, but no, they, mm -hmm. They did. Mm -hmm. While you were in training, did you have a chance to watch the news on television or read newspapers regarding coverage of the war? Only when I got home on uh, leave, which was after Camp Lejeune. I think I was home for 20 days. Mm -hmm. I don't think it was 30 then. And then I went to Camp Pendleton. Did you receive further training in Pendleton, or was that just embarkation? That was, uh, we were there, I want to say three weeks, and it was about running the hills and war games and keeping us, keeping us moving, you know, with uh, packs on our back and so forth mm -hmm. and uh, that sort of thing. And uh, I can remember it, it was cold, it was... Uh, the end of October, and it was cold up in the mountains. And uh, I can remember somebody saying, geez, we were all, the, they're probably in their house, and they were the <laughs> I says, no, they're not. There's the lieutenant. He's shaking over there, you know? So somebody lit the big trash bin on fire, and everybody huddled around it. Okay, Michael, you're about to embark for Vietnam. It's late 1969. What was your rank at the time? I believe I was still a private. And were you going to Vietnam via ship or via plane? We flew. You flew. By plane. And how long did it take you? Forever. <laughs> <laughs> Well, we flew to Hawaii first, mm -hmm. and I said, oh, gee, I've never been to Hawaii. We can poke our nose out, you know. But uh, it, was, it was like 10 o'clock at night, and they had all the doors blocked. So I couldn't even put your nose out there because they wanted to make sure nobody wanted to stick around. So um, we got back on the plane, and then... Uh, Later on, and we, when we flew into Vietnam, it was light, and I can remember coming off the ocean, looking down, and it was uh, it was a pretty sight, really. To, you wouldn't, uh, I mean, to, to see the, the square marks of the rice paddies and the things. It was green. It was all green. Um, Little would you know from looking out the window of the aircraft how destructive it could be down there. So. And where in Vietnam did you land? Da Nang. All right, Michael, you landed in Da Nang. Tell us what happened next. Well, we're in receiving like you would get receiving in. Paris Island, and you're waiting. Uh, I want to say it was three, four days, maybe five. And you, at night, you're looking at the flashes over the mountains, and uh, you know uh, stuff's going on. And what you're wondering is, I wonder where I'm going. Where am I going to be? And finally, you find you find out, and um, I said, where is it? They said it's about, it was almost 20 miles southwest of Da Nang at a uh, 
combat base, N Y. And, and can you spell that, please? A N and then H O I. Okay. So we got on the, uh, they had a convoy going, and uh, we got on the convoy in the back. Of course, we got no weapons or anything, but they, they knew it was okay. They had guards, right, and a few, few people with rifles. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, we bumped our way down, and the kids were on the side of the road giving us the peace sign and everything. And uh, finally we got to ANWA, and uh, we, we then checked in, and... Uh, then we went to some classes. They wanted us to get used to things, and they were probably processing our paperwork. And uh, they um, give us a few more classes to, mm -hmm. to acquaint us with what's going on. Mm -hmm. Now, Michael, at the time, uh, were you about to join a unit, or were you already part of a unit? I was... I was with the 5th Marine Reg Regiment, but I didn't know what platoon. And you had your classes. You were classified. Tell us what happened. And then there was about, I, wa I want to say three or four of us. Uh, they said, be down at the, the helicopter deck at 6 p.m., uh, you're going out tonight. Your unit's out. So we went down and up we went. And we went with the mail and uh, some other things they would bring out there, food, so forth. And and, and it was uh, almost dark, but not dark. And it was misty, I remember. And we landed and then you say, um, who do I see? So I went to see whoever I was supposed to. And he said, you're going to be in 2nd uh, Platoon. And uh, I went over and met my squad leader and other, other, other guys that were in the squad and in the platoon. And uh, so I talked most of the night with the squad leader. And then I lied down. Uh, he said, you better get a few hours sleep. So I lied down. Next thing I woke up, it was pouring rain and I was soaking wet. <laughs> I said, oh, no, I won't let this happen again. All right, you are now in Vietnam with the 2nd Platoon, 5th Marine Regiment. You are a little ways from Da Nang. Tell us a little bit about uh, what you were wearing, what you were eating. Uh, first of all, what, what was the uniform of the day? The uniform of the day was... Uh, the camouflage pants and um, the uh, camouflage boots that were uh, weren't like just the, the leather boots you would wear back in the states, so they could it, it, the water you know you could uh, not get so messed up with water and stuff with those boots and a camouflage shirt if it was it was cool then so you'd have on that stuff in a in a a green t-shirt underneath and um, you'd, you'd have a few other things and you'd have a, you had a thing at night that you had in your pack to sleep and wrap in uh, and I forget what they call it now but it was uh, it really made a difference so the next day um, the next day we got up and uh, made a movement, which meant we were going from where they were there to another spot. And that, that might have taken not most of the day, but parts of the day, good part of the day. And then later on we, had, we ate a lunch, uh, sea rats, uh, with crack open, and... Um, then I heard there was a, a team going out that night and from, from, from our platoon. 
So of course I wanted to jump right in. And I says I want to volunteer. I want to go out. And they said, Oh, you do? Okay, <laughs> you know. So I did. And before this, I had met a. Uh, or earlier in the day, I met a. Marini uh, was from Staten Island, New York. And I, you know, I'm from Massachusetts. I said, and so he, and he said, how old are you? And I said, 23. He says, oh, Papa-san. And I said, how old are you? He said, 18. I said, oh, baby-san. So we kind of hit it off right away. And uh, there was another kid from Alabama. He was married. And... Uh, the squad leader on the four-man team I went out with, um, he was close to leaving. He was done with his tour. And that's when I saw my first action that night. And uh, then it all becomes so real. And you, you, you say, and you still think about it, but it, you know uh, how, how easy it could be that could be you lying on the ground, mm -hmm. and uh, but it's a, it's a memory thing that will always be there. And what was the the assignment of the team going out? Were you looking for enemy or? We yeah we were actually we we were, sometimes you went on, on roving where you walked around and try to cut them off a little bit. If you heard things, then you take some more steps and you'd circle. Well, this was an LP, a listening post. And we were sitting there, and we were about to start. Um, 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 watches, night watches. Mm -hmm. And um, it was around 10 o'clock at night. And uh, all of a sudden, we heard the perimeter. From the perimeter, we heard... Uh, machine gun fire, rifle fire, then up up went the 81s, um, uh, and then up went the light flares overhead. I said, wow, so our, we had a radio, and the, the, the leader got on the radio and said, uh, they walked into our perimeter, it was a North Vietnamese, and they would move a lot at night. They... Uh, they had their ways. They knew where the spots were. Their food was packed, and but they they must have missed us moving to that spot that day. So uh, that's what it was. And then uh, when it started to calm down, uh, there was less illumination, less fire, and all of a sudden, out on the rice paddy dike came a whole row of them coming coming down and it was just like training and uh, the, the the squad leader said uh, uh, Mitchell and Green take from the middle back and Cardone and I will take from the middle of the fight on my call and we got on our knees had our weapons and he said ready aim fire and, it was, and then afterwards we went to to make sure well, they were gone. And we slid down off our hill we were on, a little knoll, and uh, it was wet. And I slid right into Mitchell, a fellow from Alabama. Well, he, <laughs> he jumped about three feet in the air. And I said, it's me, it's me. <laughs> and uh, so that was, that was the start of it all. And from the time you heard and saw the initial engagement until you slid down that nice muddy knoll, uh, do you remember how long, how much time elapsed? Was it minutes? From the time of what? From the time you first saw the uh, the bombs going off. Uh, when the enemy the, entered the perimeter until yeah. you guys uh, went down the <clears throat> excuse me went down the knoll. You remember how much time that took? It really wasn't a long time. Mm -hmm. um, these things happen fast. Um, it's not like they dragged out. It's not like uh, 
like you're on, like you see westerns on TV. Um, it it's quick because because the rest that that aren't down are gonna scatter. Um, like these guys were doing out in front of us. And so, um, 15 minutes, 10 minutes, about 15 minutes, I'd say. And um, what happened afterward? You were just, uh, did you go back to your post? No. We stayed and that was, uh, that was something I thought about. I didn't sleep that <laughs> night, I'm thinking. I wonder if somebody saw us and knows where we are. So after that, I was a very light sleeper. I used to take cat naps. That would go on the rest of my tour. Um, and I just got used to doing it that way because I couldn't get into a, a sound sleep. But um, we stayed right there until the morning when we got up and checked things. and. Actually, we had some identification, and one of the ones I checked out was a corporal in the uh, North v Vietnamese. Re he was a North v Vietnamese regular, and he had like eight citations in his little thing, and he had wrapped in a package. But they they didn't carry much with them. They carried very little, little sack, a little packet with food in it. And I don't even think they had that much ammunition. So. And was this uh, the only time you engaged the enemy, or did you have other experiences? Yes, we had other experiences. Um, we were we were in an area they called the Arizona, and the Arizona was. Um, was was called that because it was like the old uh, old days in Arizona when everything would run wild and there'd be people everywhere. You'd have uh, uh, you'd be crossing rivers. You'd be going through mush. You'd be going through uh, bushland. And it was. Uh, and and they used it a lot. They crossed it a lot, the Arizona. And uh, so we had we had a lot of times we we had action there. When we, we, they they really tried, I believe, not to ambush us unless they really had a good a good uh, amount that could take us out quick, because otherwise, you know. We were going to take them out one way or another, either by helicopter, and usually that happened a lot, you know, with the gunships and so forth. And then up in the mountains, which they call Charlie Ridge, um, that was a dangerous place. But it, uh, you got up, you got, it was during the, uh, the cold weather, the cooler weather. So when you got to the top, we were almost to the top, and uh, and, <laughs> and we we were told to send four guys up to the top just to make sure. So I was one of the four, and we got up there, and it, it it was so foggy you couldn't see you couldn't see the guy's nose in front of you. So we just kind of felt each other, you know, and and lied down. They said, well. Check out the hill. It says you check out this hill, you fall right off the edge. So it was. Uh, we didn't do it, you know. And no matter which way you call it, uh, because we had a few guys slide off the side um, a couple of times, and that was coming up. And we were at the top now, so we we didn't. What's up? Uh Let's talk a little more about what you, you soldiers were bringing into the bush, into the mountains, what have you. You mentioned the uniform earlier. Uh, what kind of sides were you wearing? Were you were, uh, bringing knives or uh, ammunition belts? Oh, yeah, we had, uh, we had ammunition belts. We had knives. Um, those who wanted them could carry them. 
Matter of fact, the 18-year-old that was with me, he always had his knife with him. I didn't carry a knife because I moved a couple of different times. I was a, I, I carried the M79 grenade launcher, uh, which was, you know, besides my pack with the grenade rounds, and uh, I couldn't, I couldn't carry anymore, you know. So um, that was the one where you put two rounds in and you, bloop, you know. Bloop, bloop. They call it the blooper because it made a blooping sound. Um, and, uh, Earlier, you mentioned uh, what you called sea rats. Sea rats. Sea rations. Uh, tell us a little more about that. The sea rations were. Uh, um, they were packages. And you'd open them up, and if uh, you were fortunate enough, you got a good sea rat, and it, with a dessert, a good dessert in it. And uh, there'd usually be a little pack with four cigarettes in there, so the smokers would swap with the guys that didn't smoke. And um, sometimes we'd take a, a helmet, a steel helmet, and we'd all chip in and put it in there and, and cook it, you know, warm it up and uh, share it. That way we did that sometimes. And then if somebody got a package from home and there was more stuff, we'd throw that in there so the meal was even bigger. So um, they also had uh, the, North, the, the South Vietnamese, the regulars that we had, the Arvins, they had noodle packs, which I thought were great. You, you'd mix them up in the helmet and uh, with water and cook it, and uh, they they were good. Mm -hmm. And and the officers, our officers got these packs packs of noodles, which were delicious, but we didn't get them. So any time a new guy came in, and we were raising the flag in the morning, we would send the new guy down to slide under their tent <laughs> and grab a couple, couple of packs of <laughs> noodles. <laughs> but Michael, did you um, have a chance to get out of the bush every once in a while for recreation? We would go back to the rear at the Enwa which was our base camp. And, um, you know, you could rest, you could write letters, you, you had your tent there, there's tents there, big ones with cots in them. And you could relax um, and uh, take it easy until the next time you went out. And how often was that? Um, Every couple months. And then they had uh, somebody come up to me, one of my, one of my mar marine partners in my group, and he said, uh, Rennie, we're, we're going on in-country R&R. &R. I said, what are you talking about? Are you nuts? I says, somebody's pulling you all leg. So sure enough, they they come in with helicopters, picked us up, and flew us into China Beach. And we we went to uh, God. I'm looking at the sign right now that sits out there off the ocean. Stack arms. That was it. And what that was, it was a, a rest area on the ocean for marine rifle companies. And you got 48 hours. And uh, so we got there and there was a set of bleachers and we all had to sit down and a gunnery sergeant come out who ran it. And he welcomed us and so forth and, and said, you know, it's a pleasure to have you. You got the beach, you got the tent, you can do this, you can throw footballs, you can. And he said, there's one other thing. 
He says, see that building behind me that's opening right now for you guys? That's the beer house. And it is full. Cold beer. He said it's open from 6 in the morning till 12 at night. He says, but if you go near my beer house, between midnight and 6 a.m., then you're mine and you're not going to like it. So don't go near my beer house. Of course, everybody's laughing and clapping. And so it was good. It was real good. Yeah. And how fast did you get to the beer house? <laughs> <laughs> Everybody got there quick. Yeah. Uh-huh. You mentioned earlier that you worked with members of the South Vietnamese Regular Army. Yeah. Uh, did you ever have encounters with uh, the native South Vietnamese? Did I ever have encounters? I mean, if you um, say you were going shopping or something like that, did you uh, ever meet, meet any of those people? No. No. Okay. We had a... Uh, a South Vietnamese scout, most, most of the units did, who would talk for them. And, uh, uh, you know, when, they, when we captured some North Vietnamese, he, he, he'd tell us what they were, where they came, and all that stuff. Um, and he was, he was good. He was a good scout we had. Um, one time we shared a hill, a small hill, with uh, Avins, which were South Vietnamese, and, and us. And I had gotten, I had turned in the information on that first night, first real night of, of the action when they walked into our perimeter. You know, that he was a, a corporal. Well, he had a bunch of money on him, too, so I kept that. And uh, they used to come up every time, wait for me to wake up in the morning <laughs> so, they could, so they could sell me something, you know. And here they would come, and they would sell, say, yeah, ice-cold Coke. And I'm saying, where do you get an ice-cold Coke out here in the middle of nowhere? It's, it's hot. It, it was, it just amazed me how they did that. But they did. Mm -hmm. well, credit their resourcefulness. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Do you remember uh, any other incidents while you were still on tour in Vietnam? Any other? Uh, engagements or encounters with the enemy? Um, yeah, when we were at Football Island, um, I was walking second, and I had the M79, and I was shooting, I would shoot off to the right and off to the left into the, a tree line, and, because we didn't know anything about the area, we hadn't been there, and, uh, the fellow from Alabama, Mitchell, he, he tripped the booby trap, which uh, almost blew off his ankle. But it, it was so hot that it cauterized a lot of it. And later on that day, we that night, I went out with the right guard. He was uh, kind of a crazy guy, but he says, let's go get him, Mike. So. Two brothers and him and myself went out that night, and we we caught we caught a whole bunch of North Vietnamese trying to come down, and we caught them when they were in the morning when they were trying to go in and in, into a tunnel, and uh, so we shoot them up and fired in uh, grenade launchers and claymores and <laughs> the. Uh, the sergeant says to me, Greeny, take a peek in there, see what's going on. So I said, take a peek in there? I don't want a peek in there. So anyway, I got 
I got down on my knees and I looked and I listened and I looked at him and I said, they're not talking. He says, okay, let's hit it one more time and we'll, we're out of here. But uh, <laughs> he was Meeks, he was, he was something. My lieutenant, I talked to my lieutenant who was my lieutenant, or he's from uh, North Dakota, became a lawyer. He uh, talks to me, he says, that Meeks, I still remember Meeks, he said. He said, I'm glad he was on our side. <laughs> okay, Michael, how long were you stationed in Vietnam? I was stationed there 11 and a half months. And were you ever wounded? I wasn't wounded. I wasn't wounded. I wasn't wounded. Okay. But mm -hmm. I ended up getting sick mm -hmm. from Agent Orange cancer. And I'm still battling that today. You're just mentioning Agent Orange. Uh, can you explain what that is? That's the chemical they sprayed to defoliate around bases so the enemy couldn't, couldn't sneak up. Um, highly toxic. It was uh, uh, bought the United States government bought it from uh, Dow, Monsanto, Hercules, and uh, like three other. And it was toxic. And we didn't know it at the time. Nobody knew it. And I know that their physicists and their uh, scientists knew how deadly that that chemical was, but they never said anything. So I remember crawling on the ground and, and feeling this like greasy, but I thought it was because of the moisture in Vietnam. There was so much moisture. Never in my life dreaming it would be something else. And it was actually not until, I want to say, five years ago, six years ago, I was up at, we built, my wife and I built a house up at Alton, New Hampshire. And I was up there down at Alton Bay having a couple of hot dogs at uh, Shibley's store there. I know them nice people. So all of a sudden a fellow pulls up outside and he says, oh, Mike, you got to talk to this guy. Well, he turned out he was a lawyer. He didn't look all, old enough, but he was. And he said to him, he says, Agent Orange, I'd lose all my skin and I'd, ha I'd be raw all over. Um, so when I talked to that lawyer who, who who got involved in a case in New Jersey where they made it and all the people were getting sick and nobody was giving them any answers. Um, I found out where the greasy stuff came from. Agent Orange was Agent Orange the chemical mixed with uh, diesel fuel. That's how they sprayed it. So, and he told me some other things that I just, I had my mouth open I just, things I never thought of or never dreamed of. So, I mean, it was slow going, slow growing for me, cancer. And then finally I thought I had like the flu. So I would, like a good Marine, I would drink, a, get a case of beer and a bottle of scotch and try to sweat it out. So then I ended up having to go to Harvard Medical and they would always tell me, take aspirins and go to bed. And I'd say, I'd be in bed for two weeks, three weeks. Then it got worse, really bad. And I ended up at Dana-Farber 
for 10 years. And I, I'd lose all my skin. It would be raw. And I'd have to sleep like a mummy. Uh, lie down like a mummy. Because if I moved, it would be like stretching it. And uh, it was hard times. Hard times for my wife. Um, that she had to put up with that. And uh, she would always, she's always been there for me and always mm -hmm. helped me. And, and your uh, wife's name is? Kath mm -hmm. Kathleen with a K. Mm -hmm. And how long have you been married? What's today? Oh, the 22nd will be 40 years. Congratulations. Thank you. Okay, let's get you back in Vietnam where you're still kind of feeling all the slick stuff there. And uh, where were you sent out of Vietnam? Was your tour of duty over? Yeah, I, um, I went an hour and a half, one hour and a half for a week. I went to Australia, watched movies and took it easy and drank and when I came back, just as a side note, a kid in my unit was going right behind me, and he was wild. As soon as he left, I said, he won't be back for a while. And sure enough, he didn't come back for, got over a month. It was like almost two months or a month and a half. And uh, he got busted a rank and fined a hundred bucks. I said, that's all? I should have stayed there <laughs> for a while. <laughs> At the time you were discharged, what was your rank? Corporal. And I was up for a sergeant. They, they said, if you want to stay, because I actually got out early mm -hmm. because uh, I had a two-year enlistment, which they didn't do that very often, and they only in a small window, and I, I thought when I enlisted it was going to be for three years, or four years even, and it was two years. So, I, you know, I didn't say anything. I just took it, you know, and went. And uh, they said, if you want to stay, you know, we'll give you sergeant. And I said, uh, I think I'll go home to see my mama. <laughs> and how did you get home to see your mama? I uh, I got flown to uh, Camp Pendleton, and uh, we we were discharged. Uh, all the paperwork was done there, and it was okay. You can go. So I wanted to be. They were um, at that time. They they were um, hiring for the Los Angeles Police Department. And they figured they needed 2,000 cops in the next five years, or vice versa, or I forget what he was saying. So I talked to a, a guy, and he said, you should have no problem. I said, okay, I'll come down and interview and do my thing. And uh, I did. I went through it. They said, uh, you're fine. You can go. I said, I want to go home for a you know, um, at least a month, because I haven't been there. And he said, okay. And then just when I was getting ready to leave, a uh, detective said, I want to talk. They said, a detective wants to talk to you. He said, okay. I went upstairs and talked to him. And uh, he said, you ever do this, ever do that? Are you gay? And they, used to ra they used to raid parties and find their own officers dressed up as women. I said, yeah, California's a crazy place, all right. Mm -hmm. So he said, do you ever do drugs? I said, well, I tried marijuana a couple of times. I didn't like it. It put me to sleep. I said, I told him that from day one. And he said, well, I don't know. I said, what do you mean you don't know? What's that mean? He says, well, chief might not let you in. I says, well, I'm not going. 3,000 miles home, coming all the way back here to find out I can't go into training. So he said, wait out here, and he went in and come out. 
And he said, the chief said no. Hmm. I was like shocked. I was, I couldn't believe it, number one. And I still, and, and I, I wish he had brought me in with him and let, let him talk to me personally. But, so, I came home. And it's all, it's all good because back then it's, uh, everything, everything happens for a reason. You know, if uh, I had a, my brother was a Redding cop in Redding. I would be the type that I would have chased guys around the corner and if they hopped the fence, I would have hopped the fence, they would have shot me on the fence or something, you know. So I was better off. And what year were you discharged? October 20th, 1970. And of course, anti-war movement is at its height. Uh, were you ever harassed because you served? Um, I can't recall directly. I mean, I heard people, but I didn't hear it directly at me. Um, I never really got into that, mm -hmm. you know, situation. Okay. All right, Michael, uh, after you did, were discharged from the Marine Corps, did you join any veteran service organizations? I didn't. Um, I belong to one now. And that is? The DAV, Disabled Veterans. Okay. And did you, um, did you have, get any accommodations or medals for your service? Uh, I think the normal ones, uh, Viet, Vietnam Service, Vietnam Campaign, Combat Action, and a Marksman badge and good conduct. And what have you been doing with yourself post-Vietnam? What kind of career did you have? Um, I went back to Hoods, who I worked for before mm -hmm. I went in, and worked there for some years, and then I mm -hmm. went uh, to the Postal Service. And what you do for the Postal Service? I was a carrier, and then I was a clerk. I did both sides. And were you in a regional office? Were you in a town? Wakefield, Wakefield, Mass. Right back to Wakefield. Right back. I knew the town. And you mentioned you had children. Uh, did your children ever express interest in joining the military? I had a son we adopted, and as he put it, go get him, Dad. <laughs> no way for him. Now, Michael, um, how do you feel about uh, the way Vietnam veterans in general have been treated over the past 50 years? For me, Personally, they've been very good to me. Mm -hmm. Top shelf. I've been coming here a long time to Bedford. Mm -hmm. In all departments that I've gone to, all the people that I've seen, they've all been so good to me. I just can't say enough. Mm -hmm. um, being up here, is uh, top shelf in this unit and I just got over uh, uh, pneumo pneumonia pneumonia okay. which uh, was bad and uh, they took care of me and uh, they just the best here mm -hmm. So, and I used to get, uh, um, I used to go to Manchester when I was up north 
and I would get uh, for my cancer. I, I got a port, and they used to uh, infuse me mm -hmm. different chemicals, and they were just as good up there as they were here. Mm -hmm. So, tops, the tops. And as far as, uh, have you ever visited the Vietnam Memorial in Washington, D.C., or have gone to the Moving Wall? Both. Both. I went to, uh, with uh, Washington, D.C., with my wife, and we met a friend of mine that I grew up with, and his wife, well, his second wife, who isn't now not a second wife, but uh, that was that was great. That was so moving. And then I've been to a couple of uh, moving walls out here. And then when I was really going through kind of a hard time, uh, we lived in uh, um, Tewksbury. They had it at Cauley Stadium in Lowell. And uh, I ended up down there. At first, I couldn't go in. I couldn't go there. Finally, one of Kathy said, "Come on, I'll go with you," and we got in. And then I was there every day. It was there, but I went down there one night by myself, at like, and I was sitting there at midnight up in the top of the bleachers, and the flags were flapping, and the lights were on low, you know, and I could hear the boys telling me, "Mike, we're okay." We're resting. We got a busy day tomorrow. A lot of people coming. Go home and go to sleep. And it really lifted something off my shoulders. And I walked down and I went home. Michael, how important was it for you to serve in the military? Very important. I'm very proud of uh, serving in the military that I served. Uh, I'm glad I fought my way in the second time. Um, I still look back, uh, and it's all it's all reason. You know, whether I would have got in the first time and I would have come home, who knows? Um, I'm glad I got in. I met people that um, are, are still good. Still good to me. Uh, people that I love, um, and uh, nobody can ever take that away from me. And uh, that's a good thing. Mm -hmm. Michael, is there anything else you'd like to add before we wrap up this interview? Um, no, I. I, I don't think I can think of anything. I think you've been very kind mm -hmm. in how you've uh, approached it and how you addressed it and how you talked about it. You've been, mm -hmm. you've been super. Well, thank you. You're welcome. And Michael Green, we thank you for agreeing to take part in the Natick Veterans Oral History Project. You're welcome. <laughs>